Bonjour, bonsoir. <laughs> How's it going? So, uh, let's get this started. Uh, this, is, this is my legal disclaimer. Whenever I give an, an offensive talk, it's like, well, most people think my talks are offensive. But, uh, but this is my legal disclaimer. It's like, so when I talk about in this talk, and I will talk about things where I've done bad things, where it's like I've broken in or I've uh, done something to, to violate the trust of somebody, always remember the kittens. I'm adorable. Okay, I will not try to steal from you, kill you, or ruin you financially unless you pay me first. Uh, there's always a contract. So uh, when you see, hear those moments, you know, just, just think about the kittens and everything should be fine. Uh, so this talk is called uh, I Pwn Thee, I Pwn Thee Not. And basically to break it down, what this talk is going to be about is uh, the top three things that I love for my target victim um, client uh, to do. Uh, the three things I love for them to do because it makes it easier for me to rob them. Um, and then also I talk about the three things that I hate for them to do because it makes it harder for me to rob them. And, you know, robbing people is fun uh, within limits. Remember the kittens? It's like already. So, uh, so that's what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about the three. And, but then I'm going to end it with maybe talking a little bit more about some of the defensive things that you can do to make your company a little bit harder and to piss off the people that are trying to rob you. So let's get right into that. Um, if you don't know about me, uh, it's like, don't worry. It's like not many people do. It's like, it's fine. Uh, but I've done a little things. I've done a show on Nat Geo in the upper left-hand corner. It's like I've been on the news on the right. But most importantly, on the lower left uh, is actual pictures of me robbing people. Uh, it's like uh, actually uh, getting an employee to get out of his desk uh, to uh, get on his computer and start operating it. Uh, the lower picture is actually from me on the south of France at a very nice hotel in their underground uh, employee area at 3 o'clock in the morning, uh, barefoot in Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle pajama bottoms uh, as I was uh, getting into their, uh, their employee sensitive areas. And then that other picture is me just holding up a computer I had just stolen from behind the teller line of a bank in Beirut. It's like where I literally just walked in behind the teller line while the uh, client was, uh, the uh, teller was working with a client and I didn't even say hello. I was very rude on that engagement. It's like, so I just walked in, unplugged the machine, it's mine, and, and walked out. So uh, that was a finding. So, uh, so th those are the things that I do. That's what I do for a living mostly is like, I like creating those teachable moments. I like being that teachable moment. So, uh, and I tell people I'm the bad guy before the real bad guy comes in and does something bad. It's like, so I do it for a good reason. Um, one of the foundations of what started this talk is just this whole... Um, industry where we keep getting and we talk about you know red teamers it's like we keep putting red teamers on this pedestal like they're ninjas they're like they're doing all these high level attacks and if you look at the upper left hand corner it's like that's what we always see you know right it's like say like, oh they're going in and doing all these elite skills and going through the skylight or they're doing all these kind of ninja they're doing all these things that are so advanced and i'm like nah i just usually walk in it's like is that elite no I don't want it to be lead. If you get to the point where you're telling your client that you did this advanced technique or you dropped O-Day on them or you went in and you, you did all these convoluted steps, all, your exec, all the executives here, all your client here is, oh, we're good. We're safe. Because you're ninjas, you're like so special and wizards and you know, you put on your robe and wizard hat and you're like, yeah, you're so more advanced. I don't have to worry about those kind of threats. So we could be, we're okay. That's not how you get things changed. Instead of showing executives how complicated your attacks were, show them how simple it can be. That's terrifying. It's like, if I go in and tell you I did all these advanced techniques, it's like, you're going to be like, okay, that's fine. It's like, you know, they're, they're, if I tell you that if I walked into a building for the very first time, never been there before, never knew any of the names of the manager ever was, and within two minutes and 22 seconds, I was behind the teller line and had full access to the bank, every section of it except for the vault for over 30 minutes, that's terrifying. Because that means anybody can walk in and do something like that. That is something that has to be fixed. That is something that has to be changed because the attacks are not always going to be so advanced. Sometimes they're just going to be that easy. And trust me, it's that easy. 
It's like, have you ever went and talked to someone and said, like, I'm from the help desk? It's like, well, you're, oh, I'm here to, to make the network run faster. Have you noticed everybody, when you ask them, is the network running slow, what their answer is? Yes, it is running slow. You could be on a T1 fiber line to your desktop, and you ask an employee that, and they'll be like, yeah, it is running a little slow. It's like, well, I'm here to make it faster. And they're like, do whatever you need. It's like, you have full access. It's like, I said, well, to make it faster, it's like, I need, oh, I need you to log in here. Here, just log back out. It's like, I'm already sitting down, so what's just, just tell me what your password is again. It's like, oh, oh, that's what it is? Okay, and, and, you, and I kid you not, in any company, it's like, you don't, you don't need to guess that much. It's like, usually it's going to be the name of the company, and if it's winner, then it's, and it's 2019, guess what the password's going to be? You know, company name, winter 2019. It's like sometimes they don't even do the company name. It's just winter 2019. Because you gotta, what happens is the password policy resets for a company is every 90 days, every three months, every season. So if I'm attacking you in January, I'm trying winter. If I'm attacking you in July, I'm trying summer. And that will work in mostly every company that you go to. It's like, uh, it's sort of sad, and that's one of the reasons why people drink, I think. But, um, but it's just a fact. And so we'll get a little bit more about to that later. So sometimes it's just that simple of just asking nicely and getting that password. And another problem that we face in our industry is your executives, their expectations, right? Because they see, they want you on that. That's what they want their enterprise on the left. That picture on the left, that is what their enterprise needs to be. That's what you need to create. That's what you need to build. You need to secure that. You need to make that happen. Uh, and then you go to them and say, yes, I want to make that happen. How much money do I have? What's our budget? And they're like, for that on the right. It's like, we'll give you enough money for that. Uh, it's like, but make it work. We want what's on the left, but we're going to pay for what's on the right. And that can be a problem, right? <laughs> it's like, because you're looking at it like, uh, no. Um, so, uh, but that's one of the things we always come because we're always trying to get more resources from upper management. We're always trying to get them to actually give us the things that they, we need, but they don't understand that. And one of the key things I think that's problem is, is because we're not explaining to them in ways that they understand. We're not showing them what that risk is because let's face it, the better at your job that you are, the less they see, Right. It's like you go up to you every, every end of the year, you have to go to your, your company. And if you've been very successful, you'll, you'll have to go and tell them, it's like, well, look, have you noticed nothing really happened this year? It's like we didn't have any breaches or there was no major outages. And they're like, yeah, that was great. Well, if you give us 2 million more euros for next year, we'll make sure nothing happens again. And how does that work? That's why they see us as a call center. So you have to create metrics. You have to create reasons for them to understand that and to actually uh, give you the, well, you're never getting that on the left, okay? Let's just be honest, okay? But hopefully you can get a little bit more than that, you know, actually get a door or something put on there. That might help, right? So at least you get a little bit more. So let's go straight into one of the first things that I love for my, uh, attack, uh, for my clients uh, to do. Uh, I love how they don't uh, train, just the basic necessity of training your employees to just question something that doesn't look right. One of the key things, one of the key factors that you have in your arsenal in information security is your employees. But you're so busy seeing them as a liability you see them, you're so busy seeing them as a problem and a possible a, a breach area that you're not realizing they're one of your best assets. But you got to train them to question and you got to empower them to question. I was on an engagement in January and I was, uh, this client was like very secured. It's like they had a very secured environment uh, in their upper office area. And you had to go through the, the, the lobby and had to go through security layer there. And then there was a security layer up, up uh, uh, in their suite. And they owned like two floors. And it was like, so they felt very secure. And I will always, and I've constantly said this, it's like the only thing worse than no security is a false sense of security. That's what gets you every single time. Because those employees were secured. They felt safe. 
So they didn't need to question when this, you know, devilishly handsome guy in a jacket, it's like, uh, I'm joking, it was me, uh, shows up to their desk and says, hi, I'm with the IT department. It's like, uh, I'm checking to make sure that our GPO policies are right for our USB read-write access on the uh, device charging policies. It's like, so you can't charge your mobile device onto our computers because it actually conflicts with the TCP SAC. So it's like, we're going to have to make sure that that's tested. So I have this cable here. Was a USB Ninja. It's like uh, it's a, it's a lightning ch uh, charger cable. I did not have a phone attached to it. It was just the cable, but with the little Adreno that's hidden inside. And I was like, I just need to test the the, the policy, to make sure it works. Let me plug it into your computer. I plugged it in the computer. I pull out the detonator. It's like it's not really a detonator, but it sounds cooler when I say detonator. It's like uh, so it's like it's this little box that's got a little blinky light on it, and it's got an antenna. It's it's cool looking. It looks like a detonator. And so it's like so I could have activated it like outside. I could have like activated it away from the. I could have kept it in my pocket and done it, but it was so much cooler and way more intimidating. I pulled it out of my jacket, and I was like, boop. It doesn't really sound, it doesn't really say boop, but it sounds cooler when I say boop. So it's like boop, and it's like all of a sudden, notepad pops up on their screen. It auto magically types out, this test completed successfully. Thank you for your cooperation. Smiley face emoji. I plugged in a charging cable, and notepad popped up on their desk. Something's odd, right? We can agree that's a little odd. That's not something that's supposed to happen every single time that you plug in a cable. What was their response? What was their reaction? Hmm, okay. Eight people in that area, all sitting side by side. I compromised their machines, every single one of them. Not one person challenged me. Not one person questioned me. Now, I do security awareness engagements. I don't do red teaming. It's like, I, I, I don't believe in doing the whole red teaming thing. It's like, what I do is security awareness engagements. So once I go and I destroy you and I, I find all the stuff and, and I, I, I get in, I wait for two minutes and then I come back and I talk to every single person that I compromised and I train them right then and there. It's like, did you know something was odd? Well, I was being a bad guy. It's like, that's what a bad guy will do. It's like, you need to know that from that next time that you see something like that, be way more suspicious. And so I, on this engagement was no different. I went up to those people and I asked all of them. And I said, serious? Didn't you think that was odd? It's like, it was just a cable. And they're like, yeah, I did think it was weird. It's like, after you left, I, I, I told one of the people, it's like, I thought that was really weird. But did you call anybody? Did you talk? No, I didn't want to make a fuss about it. It's like it was just, no, make a fuss. Make a fuss. If you see something unusual, you need to let them know and let them be con conditioned and empowered to make that change, to make that notice. One of the key things that we have a problem with is that our employees don't feel empowered. They don't feel comfortable reporting something because they want to think that everything's okay. That's the main reason why I'm successful is because if I'm not the adorable IT help desk guy, then I'm something bad. And no one wants something bad to happen. December 7th, 1941, Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. It was one of the first bases in the world with a radar station. So it had advanced warning on planes coming in. And the, the person manning the radar station there on that morning, December 7th, noticed a whole bunch of planes coming in. And it wasn't coming in from a vector that was supposed to be. There was no uh, log or traffic for that area. And so what did he do? He reported it. He went to a supervisor and said, hey, there's these planes coming in from this unusual vector. What do we do? What are they? What could it be? The world was at war. What could it be? It's like the supervisor said, oh, well, those are probably our training planes. Just disregard. Just the training planes. Spoiler alert, you know, it wasn't. It's like, but it was either that or it was something bad. And we don't want bad things to happen to us. So if I can give you a reasonable lie that sounds more comforting than the truth, you're going to go with the lie. So you have to make sure your employees question everything and feel comfortable enough to report it, to say, well, this could be this, but better safe than sorry.
Give them that empowerment. Give them that, that ability to communicate to you in a way where they see you not as someone that is always trying to find out that they're doing something wrong and have them see you as someone who is like an ally and someone who's like trying to help them stay secure. And that helps that relationship. So do that. Make sure you're, you're using them as the proper thing that they are because they're part of your security team. They just don't realize it. And if you're not utilizing, don't, they never will. So make them understand that they're part of your security team and they have responsibilities for that. One of the things I hate, it's like, uh, it's not technically the CIA, it's like, uh, but I, I do tell people it's like, it's lobbies. And I don't know if this is actually the CIA lobby. It's like, I tell people if I'm ever going to the CIA headquarters, it's probably going to be going to the back door with the bag over my head. So it's like, I, I, I'm not sure I'll ever see the front of the lobby. But, uh, but, but this is one of the things that I hate. Open, well-monitored areas. Those are horrible for someone who's trying to do something bad. You know why? Because where is the place that I can sit down comfortably and like uh, wait? It's like to, to monitor the traffic, to see where the security placements are, to see where the, the, the flow of traffic is. It's like there, there's not there. It's like so another good story, uh, which probably put me on a couple more uh, lists you know, of interest, uh, was I was in Russia uh, last year. And uh, I had some friends that work uh, for Kaspersky, and, uh, and actually I'm friends with Eugene. It's like, he's a, he's a great guy, actually. It's like, he's really cool. And I happened to be in Moscow, and they're like, hey, come and check out the headquarters. And I was like, if you get invited to go to Kaspersky's headquarters in Moscow, it's like, you don't turn that down. It's like, you know, so I'm like, sure, let's go. I'm up for it. I got plenty of time. I'm just like, you know, hanging out, touring. It's like, so I go to uh, Kaspersky's headquarters, and their office was like, their, their lobby was like really well open. It's like, there was like a, but there was this one side wall with this long couch. And it was like, looked really comfy. And I'm not technically a bad guy, but it's like, I still can't turn off that part where you think bad, right? You know, it's like, whenever you go to a building, you go things like, oh yeah, that door is not secured right there. It's like, I'd probably get in there. It's like, oh, I could like, you know, oh, I could come in. I mean, it's just, I'm always casing the place. I'm always figuring out what the bad thing is. It's like, or, or how I can circumvent something. It's just how I'm wired. So I wasn't going to do anything bad, but I look sketchy AF, let's be honest. Okay. So it's like, uh, even on touring mode, it's like, I, I looked a little sketchy. So I go in and I'm, my first thought was like, oh, Kaspersky is like, they're a security company. Let's see how good their security is. Let's, let's see where they, so I start to sit down. I don't go and register where I'm supposed to. It's like, I just go try to sit down on the couch to just so I can case the place and see what's going on. It's like, my butt didn't even touch the leather, okay? For when the security guy started coming over, you know, I mean, he was, he was big, okay? He was wearing a shirt that was two times too small or muscles four times too big. I don't know which, okay? His name was probably Ivan. It's like he, he comes in, he's like, hey, excuse me, comrade. Like, I don't know. I don't speak Russian accents. But it's like, a, it's like how can I help you? You seem to be, uh, are you supposed to be here? Is there supposed to be an appointment? Can I assist you with anything? It's like when you're that size, you don't have to be rude. It's like, you don't have to like, you know, put on a show. It's obvious where the control lies, right? It's like, so he was very polite, very nice, but mother, he was basically saying, you are not staying here until you're verified. It's like, so he kindly, I mean, luckily he didn't like kindly assist me physically, but he kindly walked me over to the registration and he stayed there until they confirmed and identified who I was and that I had business there and I was supposed to be there and I was given a visitor's badge. As soon as that was done, he was cool. I got to sit on the couch. I got to walk around the artwork. They got a really cool, weird elephant thing from Dolly that looked really neat. Uh, they, have a little muse they have a museum of all their old products and stuff. You, know, you ever seen the Jackie Chan and Eugene Kaspersky mashup thing? It's, like, it's, it's really cool. You should Google it. It's like they had a box of that, so it was really cool. And, um, and I was done because I was vetted. I was verified. I've been to other offices where they have like a Starbucks there, which is great. Because then I can like put my Wi-Fi pineapple out and start attacking people that are going in for their coffee before they go to work or they're having their meetings. It's like, and no one questions how long you're going to be there. I mean, yeah, it cost me a latte or a hot chocolate and those things are expensive at Starbucks, but still worth it because, you know, it's like I'm getting a lot of intel while I'm staying in that lobby. So um, you've got to have, when you want a secured area, your area is only as secured as your, your whole building, as what people have access to.
And if you're not controlling that, then you're having problems. It's like because people like me are going to be coming in with RFID uh, cloners, either Proxmart 3 or, or actually I think they got 4 now. It's like I don't have the 3 because I'm poor. But it's like a, you also got the Boss cloner, which is a really cool gadget that does it from 3 feet away. It's like, and you get those devices, and it's like, and those are perfect in those kind of areas where it's like where there's a coffee shop and a, or a line where you can bump up to someone. It's like, and clone their badge. Or you can like uh, hang out by, and I, I was in one location where literally right by the gate, no security, nobody had a problem with this guy, you know, in a, uh, I, I don't even think, I, I think I was wearing a leather jacket. It's like just hanging out right by the, the, the card reader. And it's like, that's not cool. It's like, because I mean, I, I do not look like I belong near your card readers at all anyway. It's like, especially there for like 10 to 15 minutes as your, your employees are going through it. So monitor those areas, keep an eye on what traffic, and make sure you let the people know that visit, you let them know that they've been recognized, that they've been acknowledged, that, they, that you've like, hey. You know, well, actually, not you. Probably you right there. Just, okay. So yeah, you got to make sure that they know that thing. You got to make sure that they're being uh, acknowledged. Now... You'll see there's a common theme of me making fun of the U.S. government and their security policies. And it's not because I, I dislike the government uh, or, or America or anything like that. It's just when it comes to really bad security policies, they seem to be really good at giving bad examples to for. So it's not my fault. It's theirs. And I, I have no regrets. So and when we talk about really bad security, you can't really even start a conversation without mentioning the TSA. And I don't want to get too mad because I still got to fly back. But um, egress filtering. How many people have a firewall rule in their company that says any internal can go to anywhere external, any protocol, allow, no logging? Do not raise your hand, you'll make me cry, okay? Because a lot of people have that rule. They're like, why do we have to monitor what's going outbound? We're worried about coming, what's coming in. Yeah, back in 2000, that was a really big concern. But now all your, now your attacks are coming from endpoints. Now I'm compromising Bob in accounting, and he's now my point of entry. So what is he doing? He's creating a secured connection outbound to my command and control device, and now I've got internal access to your network because you didn't monitor Bob going there. One of the payloads that I have on my bash bunny from Hack 5 is very simple. It opens up a command prompt and it telnets to tal.blinkylights.nl. It's a great payload because you know what happens when you open up a command prompt and you telnet to tal.blinkylights.nl? You get ASCII Star Wars. In, in, the, in the window. It's awesome. It's like, you know, the, all the little characters, it's like the little, little animations. It's great. The important thing is why does Bob in accounting have Telnet access to the Netherlands when he's in like a donut shop factory in Phoenix? Why is that necessary? If you look at one of the biggest breaches on, and the biggest example of fail when it comes to egress filtering, Sony. I'm not going to lie. I'm not trying to kick them when they're down. It's like, but how do you lose 1.83 terabytes of data leaving your network and no one going, that's odd. 1.83 terabytes. Okay. I mean, a network guy should have said, maybe we should increase the bandwidth. Maybe we need to like make the pipe big. Someone should have said something. Why is your data going to Paraguay? Especially over a terabyte. That's, that's data. It's like, I mean, it, I mean, it, it could have been just one MSX access database, but it's still a lot of data. It's 1.83 terabytes. And no one questioned it. No one questioned what that was. So you have to do that. You have to be able to show them that. So another thing is, um, one of the things I hate is dual factor authentication. Gosh, that sucks. You go through all the trouble to steal something from someone, 
and then you realize you need another piece to, to, to get in, that is not fun. That's very disappointing. It's like I hate, you know, cloning an RFID badge going like, ha-ha. And then it's like I get to the, oh, keypad. Mother, you know, it's like, where am I going to do now? It's like, it's like, I've got part of it. I don't have the second part. Um, one of the things I like about that, but it all depends on what keypad. Because I love security uh, in certain buildings. They're like, oh, we need dual factor. I have to use a hid badge. Oh, and they got to have a keypad. What's the code? Oh, let's just put a keypad on there. It's fine. It's like just everybody can have the same code. And if everybody has the same code, what happens to the numbers that are used over and over day after day? You look at the keypad and you go like, hmm, the number three, the number one, the number two, and the number four are all rubbed off and everything else looks pristine and brand new. I wonder what the code is. And it doesn't even have to be one, two, three, four. Spoiler alert, it usually is one, two, three, four. It doesn't have to be that. I still have 24 different keys that I have to try. Only 24 were four digits. I only have 24 tries to get the right one. It's like, so you have to make sure that you're using a keypad that, that you, you change out, that you don't wear the keys down to. It's like, especially when you're like in a garage area, I, I was in one place, actually in a warehouse area, it was hilarious because it, was, it wasn't worn down, it was just brown. It's like, because people's dirty hands were just like, it's like, it was just, okay, there's the key combination, I know what to use now. So make sure that you're using dual factor authentication. Uh, one of the, the, the ways that I see this is at banks. It's like banks have dual factor out there. I was going into a bank and doing a sweep and it wasn't implemented quite right because banks are very serious about their money transfers, right? You can't transfer just a million dollars willy nilly. It's like, you've got to like have controls. And one of the controls for transferring a million dollars is the person authorizing it has to have a key fob. Their digital signature. It's an, this key gives you the right to transfer millions of dollars. It's a very prized possession. 85, 90% of the time that I saw an executive's desk, the key fob was tucked into the laptop. But I'm like, that's not dual factor authentication, people. It's like, you know, that's not how that works. That's not how any of this works. It's like, don't worry, another 10%, uh, they were more secure. Uh, they literally just had, you just had to pull up in the drawer and it was in the front drawer. It's like, so they, they actually hid it from the laptop. So good on them, right? It took me an extra, it, took, it did take me an extra 14 seconds to, 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 to get that. So that, that created a little bit of a delay. Uh, but so that's something that's important. You got to let them know it's like dual factor authentication has to be taken seriously and has to actually be dual factor. Uh, one of the things that also irritated me uh, in, um, when I was going, I, I told you about the, uh, what they did wrong in January, one of the things they did right, and I had not seen very often, is they owned the whole two floors of this office building, right? So you're thinking once you're inside behind the, the security, everything should be free and open. Do you know what the mothers did? They made it where you needed to badge in every single section and department. So I sneak up through the uh, freight elevator, and I'm out, and I'm like, I'm about to go to the first door, and it's like, I'm like, oh, I'm free and easy. It's all clear now. And I'm like, oh, I'm stuck in this one section. <laughs> I hope it's a good one. <laughs> you know, it's like, I hope there's a lot of data because I don't have any more access. It was, a good, it was a good section because a lady left her badge on the desk, and I stole it, and I didn't have full access to the whole building. But it's like, but at first, I was sweating bullets because I was like, I'm trapped in this one area. So you have to, uh, so that segmentation is also really good in a physical environment as well. And people should be conditioned that it's not that big of a deal to just badge in to get through from one area to the other. So continuing on, one of the things I love is people going through all the trouble of creating procedures and then no one needs to feel like they have to follow it. And another example from the U.S. government, thank you very much for, for showing your fails, uh, is Two civilians somehow breached an Air Force base and were found only, only when one of them told the airman she had been kidnapped. Some guy kidnapped a woman somewhere in Nevada, probably Vegas, let's be honest, okay? It's like, kidnaps a woman, 
puts her in a car, drives her out to desert for who knows what, gets turned around, drives onto an Air Force base, realizes, I think I've made a huge mistake. I instantly regret this decision. It's like, freaks out, doesn't know what to do, gives the lady enough time to get out of the vehicle, run up to the guardman, whose first words I'm pretty sure were like, what the f- are you doing here? You know? I, we have to assume, I, I'm just saying, we have to assume some procedures were not followed. Okay? The guardman may not have done his job when he saw the civilian car driving straight onto the base and he let him in. It's like, or reported or didn't say anything. It's like, I mean, I'm not saying he was sleeping or, or playing video games. He was doing something incompetent. Let's just be honest, okay? And, you know, that's not the only best example of not following procedure. Uh, one, of the, one of the stories I think is really humorous, and you can Google this later to get the exact results, is back in the Cold War era, a Russian agent drove onto an uh, Air Force base, a U.S. Air Force base in Germany, okay? He drove onto the airport, walked to the airstrip, took a missile off the plane, put it in a wheelbarrow. They, did, they didn't make it clear if he brought the wheelbarrow or he stole it. I really hope he stole it because that's just cooler, right? It's like he took the missile, put it in a wheelbarrow, willed it back to his Mercedes Benz. I'm just assuming, okay, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not trying to be, you know, stereotypical, but I'm pretty sure it was a Mercedes Benz. Puts it into the back of his car, puts a red flag on the tip because it's sticking out of the window. And let's face it, German laws are German laws. You don't mess with those, right? It's like, so he put the red flag on top of the missile and drove out with the missile. He went back to his apartment He disassembled the missile and shipped it piece by piece back to Mother Russia. And let's face it, it was a German postal system. It was very efficient. It's like that was a good call on his part. It's like, and was able to transport the complete missile back. We can all agree some procedures were not followed. And that's your problem. It doesn't matter what you have on paper. If your employees are not being tested to make sure they're following those procedures, you don't really have procedures. You have guidelines, you have hopes and dreams, and those are so easily crushed. Trust me, it's like I've got plenty of stories. So it's like you don't follow those. You follow procedures that are tested and verified and repercussions if they're failing. So that's what needs to be done. That's what needs to uh, happen. So let's go to the next one. We're going to the point now, so you're, I've given you like three stories, and like, I've given you three stories of bad, three stories of good, and hopefully you've chuckled a little bit, and you're like, okay, Jason, what's the punchline? W- w- what does this do for us? What am I going to bring back? Because one of the things that I really hate about uh, conferences, it's like, a, and, and some people that are coming out here, they'll come out and they'll tell you all the different ways that they've broken something, which is awesome, because we all like breaking things, Right? But as soon as you finish, you tell me how something's broken or something's not done right, you better be telling me how to fix it. You better give me ways to make it better because I don't need just to know how it fails or how it's not working. It's like, I need to know how to make it better. So the next part of the talk is where we're going to talk about some of the things that you can take back to your company and ask them questions. And, And these are some important questions that you need to ask your company about. And see what, they, see what their answers are. You're not going to like all of them. But these are questions that you should bring back to your company to help better your security. One of the things that you need to ask yourself is insider threats. Which one fits the bill? Which do you, when you look at these two pictures, which do you want to think is, is the biggest threat? It's like, I'll let y'all later. It's like, I just realized I got, a little, I got a little laser pointer here. No, it doesn't come with a little laser pointer. Darn. I was gonna point, so the first one right there on the left is uh, you can Google that later. It's Richard Hansen or something, Robert Hansen. Uh, he was a malicious actor in the FBI. It's like he was a malicious actor in the FBI. He did really bad things for money. And, it's like, and he, he was like an insider threat. And that was malicious. And that was he was out to, to destroy and do damage. Okay, cool. I agree. But what about this, idi- uh, this person here on the right? They didn't do anything malicious. They just did something incredibly stupid. 
And that's an insider threat as well. They weren't trying to do any damage to the Department of Homeland Security, but they literally let them pose with the TSA security keys. They let them pose in a national uh, news article a way that you can conveniently now 3D print your own TSA keys. And when questioned about it, the Department of Homeland Security didn't go and fess up going, yeah, you're right, that was a mistake. No, no, that's it's government. We can't admit, you know, actual fault. We just give you plenty of examples of it. So it's like, so what they did was like, well, we don't really care too much about the concern about the security aspect of those keys. It's more of a convenience thing. It's like, this is the same government that wants keys to all your mobile devices. If they treat those keys like that, what do you think they're going to treat your encryption keys like? That's a problem. That's something to think about. Because this wasn't a malicious actor. This was just stupidity. This was just someone trying. I had one environment where one uh, um, employee who was the best employee, he was doing really good, and what he decided to do was very simple. I'm going to be more effective at my job by bringing in a wireless router, plugging the internet section into the internal network, and putting that wireless router underneath the conference table. So now when I'm at the conference table, I can still get my emails. I can still do work. I'm not just wasting the time just being in this meeting. It's like, do you know how much fun that was, finding that in the parking lot? It's like and knowing that I had internal access to their whole company before I actually got on site? That's a problem. That's an insider threat. Stop looking for insider threats from just malicious motivations, just for someone trying to actively do something bad. Look for the people that are also trying to be helpful, the people that are trying to be more efficient and are doing it wrong, the people who are just making mistakes, because those are insider threats as well. And another thing that you need to ask your employees is, um, oh, this is going further on. It's like uh, on insider threats. This is a great example of one, too. Senior Trump administrative official who met on Wednesday discussed whether to seek legislation prohibiting tech companies from using forms of encryption that law enforcement can't break. Who's terrified? Everybody's, if, if you're not terrified, I, I didn't translate that properly enough. Bad. La, la bad. Okay? La horrible. That's terrible. It's tahibla. There it is. Tahibla. I said that bad too. I'm sorry. I apologize. I'm not trying to murder your language. It's like, but that's what they're trying to do. And that's what, one of the things that you have to be worried about because they don't do good with data. This right here was from border control. One of their employees didn't do their policy right, took sensitive data, over 400 gigs that we know of, and transferred it from the internal Homeland Security network onto their personal, uh, their, not their personal, but their company laptop on their company's network. So they broke policy. They broke procedure. And then they leaked it. And instead of the, the border control owning up to it going, yeah, that was a bad thing we're doing, they decided to issue a statement going like, oh, we did a search for the dark web. Your data is secure. I'm like, really? It's like, who, who, who came up with that idea? It's like, man, we lost all this data. What are we going to do? It's like, we keep using APT. Can we, can we blame China on this one? It's like, maybe, I don't know. It's like, hey, but just say that we scoured the dark web and we didn't find nothing. That'll make everybody feel better. Normally it would. Except for when Joseph Cox did a search for like several minutes and came up with 400 gigs of that data on the dark web. So, once again, not feeling the warm and feelies when it comes to my data. So you have to be watched at and you have to cut it because no one did anything malicious in this incident. But a lot of malicious things are possible now because of it. And one of the things that you need to ask is a very simple thing. Who do you ask for identification in your facility? Do you let just anybody walk by without any proper badge or identification without being questioned? Who on this list would you ask? Who on these pictures would you ask? Everyone. Everyone should be asked. If you're a CEO, if you're an uh, executive, the janitor, especially that janitor specifically if you've seen the show, it's like, or security. They should have proper identification. You never know when your employee has been let go. Your coworker may have been doing great one day, then left off the next and still has access. Maybe he's not supposed to be there. 
So you need to question and make sure. It's like your delivery people. It's like, and I'm not telling people to go in and if you see a stranger, you know, go tackle them or something because that might be me and I'm fragile and I bruise easily, okay? It's like you don't have to directly confront the person, but you have to report it. You have to let someone know that there's someone that's strange that doesn't have identification in the facility so they can be checked and verified. It's just that simple. They have to have proper identification at all times. So the next thing is, what does your social media profile really say about you? How many people on a pen test in this day and age, and I mean, this is a legit question because I'm actually, I've never said it this way, but I'm actually curious. How many people on a legit pen test run an NMAP scan? It's like on the external IP address. There's a few. Okay, that's legit. That's not trying to make fun of anything. That's just a legit question because I don't use NMAP anymore. I don't scan your network perimeter anymore. It's like I scan your Facebook and I scan your Twitter and I scan your Snapchat and your TikToks and your, all your Instagrams and all those other little social medias. It's like me and my 35 accounts are very popular on some of those platforms. It's like, so you go over and that's what I'm scanning because that's the information I'm getting. I'm no longer attacking the network layer. We have become very, very good at securing the OSI layer model from zero or one to seven. Very good. But what about layer eight? What about the human layer? Not so much. So I'm not going to work on the stuff that I know is hardened. I want to go where it's easier. And so I always tell people, I don't have to bypass your firewall if I can bypass your receptionist. It's just that simple. It's like, I don't need to evade your IDS if I can evade your security. So you need to do that. You need to make sure your employees understand that the information that they're giving out to the world is public, usually. Some have private accounts, but most of it's public, especially for the executives. Because I'm not usually attacking the person in the mailroom. I'm attacking the executives. My first starting point on an attack is the About Us page on a company's website. Because what are you providing? The list of targets. I mean, uh, your board of directors and your executives. You're telling me who to go after. And that's what I'm gathering information from. That's where I'm doing my recon from. It's like I'm going to your company's page on Facebook and I'm looking to see which employees shared an article from you or liked an article because that means they're very active and they're very good and they're very sociable. And I love being sociable. It's like I am an 85-year-old retired Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Jack O'Neill on Twitter. It's like that my granddaughter got me involved on Twitter, and I tweet mostly about uh, mowing the lawn, working in my garage, and how social media is destroying uh, the fabric of American society. It's like I am also a 23-year-old uh, woman uh, who just graduated uh, with her uh, CPA uh, and getting into accounting. And I literally had one of my victims, uh, clients actually endorsed me for my accounting skills. And I thought that was awesome. I mean, it's like I had compromised you and you, you endorsed me. That was perfect. It was a win-win situation for me. Um, so I am uh, all these different kinds of things because that's where the information is. I had an executive hire me once to go after and spearfish his company. I went, all I did was found his Twitter account, found that he went to a conference three months before, went to the conference's website, saw their speaker list, found one that was like uh, in the same business in the same region as my target, and then I stole his identity, and then I sent an email to the executive who hired me to spearfish his company 24 hours before and sent him an email from that speaker saying, it was great meeting you three months ago at the conference. Like we talked, I still want you to be on the board of directors uh, for our site. Here's the website. Please look it over and let us know if you're interested. It'd be great to have you on board. And it was great uh, meeting you and having a conversation with you. And who here is going to remember three months what conversations you had here at this conference? Some of them, probably. It's like after around midnight, maybe not so much. Uh, but it's like he, this guy clicked on the link within 12 hours knowing that he was being spearfished. It's like social media was the only thing that I used. So you got to make sure that you're protecting your employees and your employees know that you're not trying to stifle their freedoms. You're not trying to stifle their expressions. 
But you got to let them know that they're being targeted that way, that those are the things that they're being targeted with. It's like, um, so the next thing is fishing is one of the leading causes of compromise, but do your employees really take it seriously? How many people understand that clicking on a link with a company computer on an email that they're not familiar with is a bad thing? Understand it. Not me. We still get this. It's still being done. And one of the biggest examples of that, it's like, it's, it's always, I think it's always going to be Target, right? It's like, it's always, I mean, no offense to Target, but it's, it's Target. Uh, they were not even the original cause of the compromise. Their third-party communi- uh, third vendor, their HVAC company, was hit with a phishing attack. I'm sorry, the CEO of the company said they were hit with APT. It's like, we got hit by APT. You know, because that's what you got to tell your shareholders and stockholders. It's like, no, it was APT. It was like, oh my gosh, it was like the APT got us. It's like, and, and everybody wants you to think that APT stands for what? Advanced Persistent Threats. It sounds very threatening, okay? It's like, and persistent. It's like, no, that's not what it stands for. 99% of the time, it stands for Adequate Fishing Technique, period, Okay? Don't let anybody sell you something different. It's like someone in that company clicked on a link, got compromised, and used that trust relationship to take over their networks, and they lost over $300 million. I mean, even in euros, that's got to add up to something. When you get into the hundreds of millions in mostly all currencies, it starts meaning big money, right? It's like that was a lot of money. So that was probably like 20 million euros, but still whatever. It doesn't matter. It was a lot of money. So that's an issue that you have to make sure your employees are understanding. Do you let your delivery drivers wreck their van every month or every quarter and still be okay with that? Because they're jeopardizing the cost of a van that costs maybe 100,000 euros. It's like one of those especially fancy ones, right? So why, if you don't tolerate that from your employees, your drivers, that's that's part of their job is to use that equipment properly, safely, and effectively, then why are you letting your users get away from constantly clicking links that are jeopardizing your company that you can lose millions off of? You need to make sure in your environment they understand that clicking links have repercussions, that there are consequences for that kind of behavior. It's like, I'm not saying you fire all of them, at first, it's like you have to educate them. You have to show them what they can do to protect themselves, how to start thinking critically when they get suspicious emails. That's on you. But if Bob in accounting, and no offense to Bob's or people in accounting, but if, the, if Bob in accounting keeps clicking on those emails every you know, quarter or every month, then Bob needs a serious talking to. It's like he's not helping your company. He may be one of those insider threats that you just didn't realize. So you need to educate them. It's like, and another thing, and once again, it's like, I, I, I'm, I, I literally, I'm not deliberately picking on the U.S., but they have so many good examples of how to be stupid or bad at security. Uh, but here's this, this just was from last week. Uh, the NSA improperly overcollected call detail records for a second time last year. Documents show renewing privacy concerns about the surveillance program due to expire in December. And have you ever noticed, like with the CIA or NSA or Facebook or any of these other uh, collective agencies, they never accidentally make a mistake where they take less data? It's like, have you ever gotten an email from Facebook saying, oh, I'm sorry, due to our recent upgrades, we actually made all your things more private and harder to be seen by everybody. Sorry about that. No, it's always, oops, sorry, we changed your privacy settings. Everybody, including your ex from 12th grade, gets to see your profile now. You may want to fix that eventually. It's like, so it never works out. But this is a key thing, though. This is a key concern. And what it is, is are you vetting your security systems? How many people send from the security, uh, security team, do you send someone in your company a virus? Are you doing that? You should be doing that at least once a quarter. Send a malicious program to an internal machine that is, you know, can be segmented off a network. It's like, Jason, I just, I just, I just, I'm going to check my Twitter later. It's like, Jason said to infect our network and stuff. And no, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying test your security products. 
in a real world environment. Don't just assume because the sales engineer said, you're done, that you're done. It's like, you know how many times I've gone and I've seen an uh, IDS installation? Because IDS, IDSs are awesome, right? Intrusion detection systems are amazing until you start getting all the hits from the signatures. Because how many people, I've seen companies put a, insta, uh, install an IDS system, put a default signature base in there, and they're like, you know, it's like, I don't know what to do with all this. And so what do they do? They just... Accept, 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 so they don't have to see it anymore. You should be fine-tuning those machines, and you should be testing them. You should be able to make sure that if you send a malicious email uh, with a package from the external area, and it goes into an email into your company, that it's been vetted that some kind of alert goes off, or that it gets stopped altogether. You need to be able to verify those things. You don't just go by what the sales engineer says. You need to test those machines. You need to test those security procedures. You need to make sure that they're working. You don't put an antivirus in and hope for the best. You know, it's like, well, we keep our, updated, our signatures updated. We're good. No. They have to be tested and make sure that they're working the way they're supposed to. It's like, and then the last, last one, I'm almost done. It's like, so, so I went real early for the keynote and I'm going really long for the other one. So I'm trying to balance it all out. It's like, so... Once again, and I am going to beat this horse till it's like it comes back to life, okay? It's like it's not even, I'm not even kidding a dead horse now. I feel like I'm resuscitating it, okay? It's like always educate and empower your users. They're your best line of defense, and we're hardly using them. It's like we keep trying to buy the really cool blinky boxes to protect our users, you know? And I mean, the blinky boxes have gotten cooler. I mean, they've got blue lights now instead of red lights. I mean, they're way nicer. But stop trying to get technology to protect your users. Start understanding that you need your users to protect your technology. And if you don't have that, you don't really have a good security plan. It's like, so make sure that you're utilizing them and that they know they need to be utilized. Make sure they're, they understand they're part of the team, not part of the threat. And treat them that way, and you'll have a better pr uh, program. Y'all think I'm joking. I am done. Are there uh, any questions? Oh, I love you too. Hugs later. And I will be here for a long time. So if you want to come up afterwards and get a hug or, or talk, I mean, I'm always approachable. Please do so. That's, that's the reason why I come to these conferences. I think I said that earlier. It's like, uh, it's to meet and greet. It's like a network. Does anybody have any questions? All right. Oh, wait, here we go. Thank you very much. Uh, where do you put boundaries or borders between hacking in social and um, private social life of people and try to hack into the companies? I mean, like, I'm not going to lockpick someone a house just right. because I want to have maybe f private company files in there. I mean, just to know where do you put the boundary? Where's the line? Yeah, yeah. And that's a good question. Thank you. Uh, people talk about that. They're saying it's like, well, you, well, you're going after the users on their private moments. and their pri It's not private. It's public. It's like, I, I am a bad guy. I'm there trying to rob you. We've already established my moral boundaries, right? I'm trying to, I have never been mugged anywhere where it's like, I'm really sorry to do this, you know, it's like, I mean, ignore the gun, I mean, it's overkill. I mean, no pun intended, but I need your wallet and your credit cards and everything else. I mean, I hate this has to happen, you know, this way. It's, it's very awkward for both of us. It's like, can you just give me, you don't get mugged like that unless you're in Canada, right? <laughs> it's like, no one does that. I'm there to, I've broken into a building before in a wheelchair. I've already established I'm a horrible person trying to steal from you. It's like, judge me all you want, I'm there to get paid. It's like, so I am going to go over like a bad guy and I'm going to look at your social media things to find ways to get in, to find ways to make it sound more convincing that I'm one of your friends, to assume the identity of your friends, saying, hey, it was great going to that party that we went to last Saturday night. It's like, I hope you had fun too. Uh, by the way, I found this story. Click on this link here. 
It's like, that's how that works. Because they do remember going to that place with that party. They don't remember the fact that they posted it publicly on Facebook and that person also checked into the same location. It's like, I, was, I literally showed him one of my examples of a person who worked for a bank in the U.S., and on her public profile, we were not friends. And trust me, after this talk, we were never going to be friends. It's like on her public profile that anybody could see was her phone number and physical address. The very next slide in that presentation was a picture of her house. Now, don't think I'm creepy. I didn't go to her house and take a picture. That, that's, I, have, I have limits, okay? It was from Google Street View. But it was still a picture of her house. People in America are still being uh, kidnapped after they close up the bank and held overnight so they can open it up because of the time sensitive thing of the vaults and they're being held overnight to open up and rob the bank the next morning. That still occurs in the US. And that's what she was opening herself up to but she didn't see that because she didn't understand that online activity and things that you say online can translate to real world threats. And that's what we're there for. Our, we're not there for just to like be all, oh, well, we're just going to scan this and we're going to go this range. We don't want to go too, you know, too hard because that, that might hurt their feelings. I've established I'm trying to rob you. It's like anything that I can do to rob you that's not going to get me in more trouble and a criminal doesn't have that kind of leeway. It's like I have some boundaries where like, yeah, that's a little bit too much for me even, okay? It's like a criminal doesn't have that. So the employees need to know it's not about their freedoms, it's what information they're giving that can be used against them from someone who's trying to steal from not just them, but from their company. Is there any other questions? Yes. Uh, make, make it short, please. Soon we, our technical team will uh, need to add a, a turnover. Just a, a little question about the, what's, what, are, what are your thoughts about the, um, the stealth aspects when doing a physical uh, intrusion in, in, uh, in buildings or in company uh, to avoid the cameras or to avoid too many witnesses from the company? Oh, I do not try to avoid anything. It's like uh, I, my whole, one of the best things that you can do when you're doing something really evil is to not act really evil. It's like when I go into a location, it's like I walk, I'm like, I own this place. What's up? You know, it's like I'm going straight. In. And every location, I do that. I immediately walk in the door and I just start walking. Like I know exactly where I'm going. And it, trust me, I'm not cool. It's led to some embarrassing places. There was one time in Cyprus where I walked in this branch and I'm like, walked in, turned around the corner. And there wasn't a stairwell that I thought there would be there because the way the building was out, it was actually a blank wall. And I'm like, this is awkward. Because <laughs> now i got to walk back to everybody in the lobby and they're like, what the, what's he doing over there by the wall? It's like, I don't know. It's like, and I got caught one time in, in a company because I did that. I walked purposely uh, to the back of the, 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 all these glass offices. So everybody saw me walking to these empty offices where nobody was. And I'm like, oh, I should have stopped at that guy. Uh, so uh, you don't try to avoid eye contact. You don't try to avoid cameras because once again, you go into the assumption that you're, you're, robbers don't, if robbers actually thought about the odds, they wouldn't be robbers. We ought to, you gotta understand criminals aren't the best critical thinking process people, right? Because they all think they're gonna get away with it. They all have like, I mean, how many times are you like, oh, we're gonna do this, and we're like, I know it's like acne hour, right? It's like, it's like, but they all think they're going to get away with it. So that's what you try to do. It's like, I smile, I laugh, I joke. I can't be a, good, a bad guy. Look how adorable I am. It's like, I'm not trying to steal from you. It's like, and those are the threats. It's like, people acting suspicious or shifty, it's like, people are afraid of that. People know about that. It, it feels nervous. If I go right up to you and say, hey, I'm with the IT department. We're trying to check your USB rights. Let me put, thank you very much. It's like, uh, have a nice day. It's like, no one questions that. So I never tried to avoid cameras. I never tried to avoid interactions. One of the best security social engineering countermeasures that I have in my bag of tricks is when I'm walking by someone and they look a little bit suspicious, my very first reaction, hey, what's up? And just keep going. That's it. Because I initiated contact. I said hello to them. 
So now I'm like, well, he must be cool. It's like he said hello. He's very polite. You know, it's like he must know me. I mean, you, you know, I'm expecting people to avoid contact. It's like, I'm going, like, hey, what's going on? I, when I saw one person in this one engagement where they were looking at me suspiciously, I literally walked around the, to them. Say, hey, I'm trying to find this person. It's like, can you give me a directions or help me out to, to their location? And had them walk me to the place that I needed to be. Because that makes them feel more comfortable. So you don't try to dodge or try to, you try to make sure that you're looking like you're open and you have nothing to hide. Because that's the people that have a lot of stuff to hide. It's like, look at politicians. Thank you, Jason. All right. I there you go. Should. Thank you very much. I, I will be here afterwards. So if you've got other questions, come find me. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you for all your Love this conference. Love you guys. You're nice. Right.